Um, welcome to today's Harvard Data Science Initiative Industry Seminar. My name is Liz Langdon Gray, and I'm the Executive Director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative. And I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Ron Papka from Voya Investment Management. Ron is Senior Vice President and Head of Data Engineering and Governance at Voya. He has spent over 30 years in the financial services industry, creating applications of analytics across capital markets, asset classes. His career has included leadership roles across many familiar names, including Citi, Barclays Capital, Lehman Brothers, and BlackRock, where he built data, analytics, risk, and trading system software for those companies and their clients. Ron also lectures in applied analytics at Columbia's School of Professional Studies. His academic work is in the field of machine learning and information retrieval, and his primary interest is financial news modeling and natural language processing with a focus on prediction algorithms using very large data. We're incredibly grateful for Ron's time today. Before I hand over, I'd like to remind our audience that there will be time after the presentation for questions. You can put your questions into the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen to send questions at any point during the presentation. With that, let me thank you all for being here and a special thanks to Ron. Ron, over to you. All right, hey, Liz, thanks so much. In Harvard, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to be here on uh, the, uh, the start of our NCAA basketball tournament, one of my favorite sporting events uh, uh, that we have. So let me share my screen and uh, we could get into it. So. Again, my name is Ron Papkin. Today, I'll be speaking about the use of data science in the financial sector. Uh, I, I hope by the end of today that you find out that while data science is all fun and it's great to code and the algorithms are really cool, uh, but actually like building a real application that uses data science it, and bring it to the finish line requires a lot more than a lot of brains and coding skills. So hopefully we'll learn what those uh, capabilities that you have to have are. And then uh, also after today, I would expect you to have a better understanding of the financial sector, the types of companies that are in the financial sector and how they use data science uh, or the potential for them to use data science. So just to give you a little bit about my background, uh, I started working on computers in the 70s when I was in high school. So uh, I just out of curiosity, I know you guys can't answer this question, but I will ask um, how many of you know what the picture is behind these words? Does, does, does this picture look like anything to you? Um, usually most people don't know what, what that, that's a picture of, but I'll, I will tell you they are punch cards. And so when I started learning how to program, I learned on the, uh, the school system's Prime 400 mini computer. And basically we'd write programs with punch cards and that's how we did it in the seventies. And the last program that I wrote, I spoke to my computer and I asked it to build a website for me. I needed three different pages and uh, I was amazing at how good the code was. So I've gone from punch cards to actually talking to my computer to actually get the code uh, written. So that's been really the span of my existence. It's been really uh, pretty exciting to see the evolution of uh, AI, data science, NLP, machine learning, all those uh, fields that computer scientists and mathematicians just just uh, love. But, you know, back to, uh, you know, how I got into the space, um, you know, my career has gone back and forth between industry and academia and back, you know, back and forth. Uh, I started at IBM. I worked as, uh, in IBM as an undergrad when I went to Columbia University and I was working in marketing and I was able to uh, come up with marketing plans for IBM's PCs being sold to Ivy League students. So they started at Columbia and I'm sure at some point the campaign hit Harvard, but back then, you know, the machines that we were selling were, uh, had, uh, 360K floppy disk drives, and they had uh, 10 megabyte hard disks, and that was the best you could possibly get. Uh, amber screens over green screens was my preference, but that's what the machines were like back then. Um, after finishing Columbia, I uh, actually had a software company. So I, I was coding in my studio apartment in New York City for about two years in a startup, and it was 
fun, but I felt like I was missing something, that there was a whole world out there outside the studio apartment. And I found myself looking for more interesting work. And I just fell into the financial markets, not really knowing that they were really interested in, in programmers. But I, I started a banker's trust uh, in 1989, and that was my first job on Wall Street. And one of the things that, that I was able to do with bankers, you know, this was back in the days where uh, they talked about liquid lunches. People went to lunch for four hours and then went on the golf course, like really bankers days, bankers hours. And we used to come into the office and beautiful mahogany wood offices and desks. And we all read the Wall Street Journal from front to back. And I said to myself, boy, there's got to be a way to read this newspaper and predict stock prices. I felt like when I read the journal, I was on top of everything. And I would, you know, if I could get a machine to do it, I would be able to, I would be able to make a lot of money. And that was actually the, the problem, the motivating problem that I worked on for really the rest of my career, where I went back to Brown uh, to study natural language processing uh, with Eugene Charniak and, and studied neural nets and cognitive science with James Anderson. Uh, so gr grandfathers of neural nets and NLP um, you know, helped me get to kind of the next level of algorithmic understanding. I went back to the financial world. And at that point, I felt like I was at a point in my life where, you know, I already worked and um, I found that the people that I work with, they all have PhDs. And so I felt like if I wanted to even become a better programmer, learn more about solving this problem that I was really passionate about, namely reading the newspaper and predicting stock prices, I should go back to school. So I, I, and I got into a bunch of PhD programs. I went to UMass Amherst mostly because I just loved the place. And also they were working on something called information retrieval that I knew was really interesting. And uh, information retrieval is a pretty old science and it's, uh, you know, uses, uses data structures that are like over 2000 years old. For those of you who know what infer inverted lists and inverted files are. Uh, but I ended up studying that at, at, at UMass while uh, Sergey and Bryn were working at Google, working on Google exactly the same time. So Google started uh, really the same time I graduated. And actually there were several people in my lab uh, at UMass that went to Google and they said, Ron, come on over to Google. And I'm like, Nah, that stuff's boring. So I, I, uh, I kind of missed out. But you know what? I, I don't feel like I missed out because anytime I've delved into technology, big tech, it kind of bores me. My passion really is in the, it has always been in the financial uh, industry and in research and academics. So uh, I worked for the big banks. I worked for asset managers. We'll talk a little bit of, a, a little bit uh, more about them as we move forward uh, in the in the talk. But um, Back in uh, 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 2000, really before COVID hit, I started lecturing uh, at Columbia's data science um, uh, program, uh, and I found it really exciting to be able to teach again and to be able to teach at your alma mater. It's, it really feels terrific. There's nothing like, you know, being in a classroom in the halls that you used to take classes in and, you know, seeing the students and being on College Walk, and I'm sure... Uh, people teaching at Harvard probably uh, that that were alums probably have similar experiences. So that so that's been really exciting, and uh, and I'm glad, very happy to be able to talk about uh, what I do in 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 terms of the systems that I built, and and talk to you uh, you know more about the financial sector. So you know first a couple of definitions, real simple. I really love Tom Davenport's glossary. I mean it's real simple, right? We have analytics. You know, maybe there's four types of analytics, but there's description, descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive, right? We, we talk about that over and over again. And I feel like those three patterns, like you give me a, a solution to a, a problem, it's solution, you could point to one of those three buckets of what you're doing, you know, assuming you're working with data. So let's get those out of the way. And then we got uh, the finance side. So we're only going to talk about two types of companies, buy side and sell side, right? The buy side firms are firms that buy securities. They manage people's money. They have a conveyor belt of money coming in and coming off of investments that they make and they need to keep 
uh, as they say, keep investing or the money ends up dying in the bank, right? They can't stay in cash. They constantly have to invest their clients' money in other pro products. That's the buy side. The sell side firms, they're the brokers, the broker dealers, they bring securities to market. They're the ones that, you know, when IPOs come about, they're the ones that are bringing the IPOs to market and all and sponsoring all those big parties and all the big legal effort that goes into uh, creating mergers and acquisitions and deals such as that. So just a, a, a little preview, you know, just some other definitions. I mean, for me, look, I feel as though I'm a computer scientist. AI definitely existed, but we always talked about AI in terms of, uh, you know, things that were, uh, you know, uh, biologically pl plausible algorithms, right, uh, was AI back then. Data science came along later, and there is a lot of art to data science. And we've also talked about machine learning. We talk about NLP. Let's just talk about all, all of them together. Um, you know, but there is there is very uh, things that are very specialized about data science and data scientists and how they look at the world. And uh, you know, I'll work on focusing on uh, data science type applications in the rest of the uh, in the rest of the discussion. So. Well, let's get going. The business cases for the sell side. So what, you know, let's go back to what is the sell side, right? They're the banks, they're the investment banks. They do sales and trading. Uh, they create loans. They have giant loan portfolios, both for retail, people who own homes, as well as people who own these, you know, giant commercial buildings. You know, every skyscraper has got a loan behind it that some bank brought 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 to market. Now we hear obviously a lot more about uh, crowd investing and fintech and whatnot. But let's face it, the way the way things get built, they're built with someone lending money somewhere, and it's a bank that's that that the banks lend money, right? And they also they also create uh, securities. So who are they? I mean, they're J.P. Morgan, they're Goldman Sachs, they're Citigroup, Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, right? Those are the big names. Everyone, when I was growing up, wanted to get an analyst job at a bank. That was the, that was the ticket to being rich was that you were going to become or you were going to become an investment banker. And I, I really uh, think that people are still really interested in that field. I mean, the financial industry, the sell side is where all the action happens. If you read the Wall Street Journal and you're reading about deals uh, and, and things that are going on in business, like when you're in banking, you feel like you're, you, you, you're part of the front page of the Wall Street Journal, not the political side, not the war that's going on, but the business, you, you, that, that's where it happens. It's, 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 it's the US banking, it's the international banking world, and it's big money, big bucks, giant salaries, and they love their technologies. It's a great place to be. Data science, artificial intelligence, a little bit more challenging for, for, the, sell, for, for, for the sell side to actually implement and actually use. And, and maybe we'll understand a little bit more about that and why that is uh, maybe towards the end. But, you know, what, what are the patterns? Like, what are the, the, you know, the data, the analytics patterns, the data science patterns that they have? Well, if you look at what bankers do, they only do three things, right? They prospect, they get new business, right? Imagine all the algorithms you could write to figure out what the next client to go to. Even in your existing clients, try to figure out what's the next thing I want to sell them. That's all about client prospecting. Then you have a client, right? And the clients, you know, they're a, a, a client of the bank and they could go banking in five other, six other places. We, we just rattled off six of them. It, you know, they could give their wallet share to whomever, like who's who's providing the best service to them, who's making them happy um, servicing. There's so many opportunities to, to to service your client. Right. Because you've got to keep tabs on them. Right. You want to be able to, um, uh, well, understand them. You want to be able to sell your services uh, and well, connect their needs to what you have to offer. You know, how do you do that without being a pain in the neck? There's so much in algorithm in the algorithmic space we could do to figure out how to service the clients and who to who to who to go to next. And then once you have your clients, you don't want to lose them. So you want to be able to monitor and detect when your clients are about ready to leave. 
And you, you know, imagine what this is like, what, what it's like doing this on the sell side, right? So the sell side, they usually have different um, departments that are big, right? So, so you could have investment banking, sometimes they call it marketing. Uh, you could have a commercial bank and you could have a retail bank. JP Morgan, Citi, Bank of America, they have all three businesses. Some of them even lop on a, a, a buy side, have an asset manager. Morgan Stanley has asset management. JP Morgan has asset management. Citi has divested its asset management and sold it to Morgan Stanley. So, right, so so they have like these, these core businesses and the conglomerates uh, intentionally try to diversify. If you take a look at how the banks made their money, they've never made so much money in their lives. And the reason why they made their money is because they have these commercial loan portfolios that are a trillion dollars whose value just went up significantly. The amount of billions of dollars that roll off in net interest income. Banks make their money off of net interest income and deals. Whatever they lost in deals because of COVID was, was paid triplicate with net interest income back to the banks. That's why they're all still in business. That's why JP Morgan keeps on hiring. And while City and Bank of America are going through uh, replumbing, they're gonna have plenty of jobs waiting for, for, for you guys uh, as the bulldozers leave and, and the new people come in and they've restructured and they're ready to hire. They're gonna want data scientists, they're gonna want AI, they're gonna want people who program, people who know how to build products. Uh, it's very product orientated nowadays. Um, but the three pa patterns in the sell side remain the same. It doesn't matter what group you go to. They prospect, they service the clients, and they're worried about the clients leaving. What you know, where where's the opportunity for data science in the sell side, right? So we talked about the business of sales trading and research. Uh, you know, we talked about coverage a little bit, right? The the sales force is shrinking when they come when when they when the axe comes for people for what they call operational efficiencies. The first place it's going is sales and the next place it's going to operations. The sales force is shrinking. The, the, the existing salespeople that survive are being forced to cover more and more clients. The smart ones are deploying the tools. The, the antiques are sitting with their Rolodexes in their golf carts, in, uh, you know, in their country clubs. It's one way to sell, but the you know modern salesperson is using advanced techniques. If you do find yourself in a bank, find yourself a salesperson, a trader, someone in research to team up with and figure out how you could help them. If you end up on the technology side of the bank, not directly in one of those groups, this is teaming up with someone who's interested in the future and interested in using the tools of the future is really key. The opportunity in sales and marketing is tremendous. Every, everyone's talking about like the big buzzwords, client 360. It sounds like something digital. It sounds like stuff that we talked about five years ago. The banking industry, the sell side is still not there yet. They can't get on the cloud in reality. Imagine all this money, all the smartest people. They could hire anyone they want. They, they, they spend millions of bucks on technology salaries. They can't get into the cloud. Um, and it's very difficult for them to use uh, these algorithms because of uh, because of risk associated with models. They're afraid to use them. They're afraid to use AI or data science or predictive in front of their clients. In fact, they can't. They're, 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 they shy away from it, uh, unlike other industries that are all built on like tech, built on figuring out how to how to prospect, you know, using the algorithm. They can't use they can use the algorithm to prospect, uh, but 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 the automation um, in terms of uh, doing things directly with the client is, is really limited. You have to put a human in the loop. We'll talk about more about that later. Operations. I'll, I'll go back to it also later. Uh, security is huge. Like, how do you, you know, these banks, you like wouldn't believe how many times a day they get pummeled with denial of service and, and, and just 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 nefarious you know, rogue actors, I, I, it's it's mind numbing. Like if I ask you, like how many times right now do you think Bank of America got hit? Like in the time I started talking, it like is measured in the tens, if not hundreds of millions of times. It's that much, they're like getting a billion, 
uh, uh, billions of hits a day of people trying to penetrate the firewalls. You know, look, most of it's harmless, but then some of it's not, and you end up seeing it in the papers. And so they're spending a lot of money in security and figuring out how to avoid this and how to get in front of these risks. Fraud detection is a big thing in the banks. Really, just infancy. They don't use a lot of data science. They try to. A lot of things are really operationally, but it's a very, very hot area also in the sell side. The banks, it's really interesting. When you're a commercial banking client of a bank and the and, and someone steals your money, the bank's not at fault. You're at fault. It, the commercial bank and the client owns the risk. When you're in a retail bank, right? City, same thing. I'm, in, I'm a Citibank customer, Bank of America customer. I'm a real estate client and I get ripped off. For the most part, the bank owns the risk. Right, they own the they own the credit card fraud risk. Right, obviously they're going to spend time investigating. They own the risk, commercial bank, and they don't. But the thing is, if they don't, if they can't keep up with the fraud and the risk on the commercial side, the clients leave and they take their wallet share to the next bank. Because honestly, all the banks look the same to the clients. They all are at the same level of digitization, same level of service. There are no differentiators in the top, the, the top banks. The differentiation, though, could come from the services provided through these data science or, uh, algorithms. And then finally, on the sell side, automation is really the key. Um, you know, you have people, less people, more coverage. Traders need to be in five places at once. They have to be talking to clients. They have to be trading. And then, you know, they have a whole bunch of paperwork at the end of the day, getting ready for the next day. And so... You know how you know automation within the office for them uh, uh, is it, it is really valuable. Um, being able to monitor their own chats and messages when clients ask for prices, being able to not send you know the email over to your assistant to get the price out, but to push a button and get the price out is 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 what they're after. Reconciliation. There's lots going on in operations automation uh, around around uh, trading. Um, so let's pivot now. That's the sell side. Those are the ones making the security. And who's the buy side? Right. So the 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 who are the buy side firms, first of all? So let's put some names on them. Um, well, the ones I like, I guess I've worked for BlackRock. BlackRock's just a bohemian. I mean, just amazing. I, I worked for BlackRock. I was employee 168. So it was 168 people. It was about 168 billion of assets under management. And uh, that was in the year 2000. And they just managed like, you know, a huge percentage of the world's money. <laughs> Amazing, like trillions and trillions of dollars and, you know, just just more influential and with more influence. I mean, just uh, it, it, into a larger sum. But who are they? They're BlackRock, they're PIMCOs. Your asset manager, MetLife, New York Life, right? These are your life insurance companies. Why are life insurance companies in the financial sector? Well, think about it. I mean, they're selling financial products, life insurance. They take in premiums, they put it in an account, and they have to invest in that premium. So when someone in the pool passes away, they have the money that they promised them to give to their uh, their beneficiaries, right? So they, they are... a they are asset managers. They have a voracious appetite for bonds, for fixed income, uh, equities, anything that they could put their money into that makes money with, uh, you know, gives them a good risk adjusted return on their, on the, on, on their investments is what, is what they're looking for. Um, right. Mutual funds, the insurance companies, the pension companies, all the states have pension companies that, you know, some of them, uh, particularly on the West coast, we hear about them in the news. CalPERS, for example. Then we have hedge funds. Hedge funds are, are buyers of securities, right? They think they have an algorithm that could buy and sell securities. The ones that got smart don't do that as much, but they became market makers, right? So companies like Bridgewater, uh, they became, you know, uh, they are uh, they are making money by being the one buying and selling and, 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 and creating the market. So they're making money off the spread. Which is a great way to make money. That's how the that's how the the the, the sell side makes money is off a of spread. Um, two sigma 0.72. Two sigma is probably the one that's known best to be making a ton of money with uh, an army of a couple hundred PhDs. The smartest people want to go to two sigma and work on algorithms. 
uh, really um, interesting uh, company and they're very into technology. It's a great place to work and uh, you get to work with a lot of really smart people and they do manage to uh, year over year create alpha. Uh, Point 72 is another one. So, you know, the buy side, what I found interesting coming back to the buy side, I'm at Voya, Voya's a buy side firm. We manage about $350 billion. And, and we manage fixed income, equity, privates, loans. We, we have insurance. We, we have all, all these different products. And what I found so interesting coming to the buy side again was refreshing what I saw in terms of, you know, data, the use of data science, machine learning, even generative AI, um, I found that the fixed income quants and the equity quants at Voya had a lot of models already. Like each one of them, maybe 30 to 40 models out in production, doing this stuff, using it to help them figure out what to buy and sell. And we could talk about some other, other patterns on the buy side in a minute, but uh, they're using it where when I was at the sell side, you know, I was in the commercial bank and I owned the NLP models for the commercial bank because that's where we found the use of, you know, machine learning uh, was on the NLP side, not on the predictive analytics side. Um, it was shunned away. Like the best we could do is descriptive and maybe prescriptive, you know, using descriptive data. You could use descriptive and turn it into prescriptive pretty easily. And, you know, for a data scientist, that should be bread and butter but it's hugely valuable to be able to put that, you know, that, that, that data together for someone, because you could use it for a lot of different, uh, different use cases. Um, anyway, what I found in the sell side is that like, I, I think I own maybe 20 models for, and I own the models for the commercial bank, you know, the NLP models, the AI models, they were kept, they were kept separately for the risk models because the risk models are more from the mathematical side of things, more from the, old school way of fixed income and portfolio management. It's all closed form, right? There's no, there's no genetic algorithm figuring out the present value, right? You just don't do that. Um, you know, it's a different, it's a different type, a different type of model. But the but the AI ones, I I owned them and each one of fixed income and equities probably own twice as many models as me. So they, so the buy side is using this stuff. It's the place where it's more accepted because they have less risk using it. And my guess is they don't necessarily have more opportunities to use it, but the buy the sell side is very limited due to regulatory uh, oversight, right? They're, they're they're just the regulators are spending their energy on the banks, and rightfully so. They spend less effort and less calories, as we say, on the sell side because the sell side, you know, if someone goes belly up, they're going to be there. But in general, they're not spending their energy on regulatory issues, on data issues with the sell side. The sell side seems to be um, not off limits, but not, not a focus. And so the buy side is, it's easier for them to take on the unintended consequences of using these algorithms uh, you know, in their in, in their day-to-day. -day. But the buy side, the people that you're, you know, you're selling your ideas to, they're portfolio managers. And the portfolio managers have a voracious appetite for analytics. And, um, you know, and, 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 you know, the other thing about the buy side is, you know, you got to think about what, what, what the algorithm is going to do in terms of its value proposition. What's the, what, what, you know, what's the algorithm going to do for, for, for them. And so let's see a little bit more about where, uh, where we, we, we can, you know, find opportunities in the buy side. So, so, so just a little bit more about that. Like, what are they interested in? Well, the buy side usually buys all these securities, like, you know, a universe of hundreds if, of thousands, if not millions of securities that are available, fixed income, equities, loans, derivatives, uh, structured product, uh, uh, all sorts of asset-backed securities. They could do a reverse repos, forget even go to the derivatives market, options, futures, options on future, all all these really interesting things. There's so many asset classes and to get a leg up on an asset class is, is not so easy. And it requires a lot of data and it requires modeling and it requires, you know, trial and error experimentation. You know, the, the, the researchers on the buy side, I think have a really interesting 
job. I mean, they do buy and sell things, but I think they also take more of a data science approach to it things versus like what a what a trader might take advantage of. I found that the traders take advantage of operational uh, holes. All right, they figure out where the hole is. Someone missed something. Someone forgot to read a line in a contract, and they they figure it out. Kind of like the the, the people who are breaking, you know, the security uh, nemesis is they they just figure out some hole and they get in, and then you know eventually it gets patched up. Whereas the the buy side is very more meticulous in, in terms of analyzing portfolio, analyzing their benchmarks. Because the fact of the matter is, the utility function for the financial industry is not to try to extract as much profit out of their clients as possible. It is not because the clients would not win. It is not to, it's not the, it's not in BlackRock's interest to take over the whole entire asset management uh, uh, world because there, there's no point in having only three people doing it. It would be a monopoly in which the markets won't work. So they, they, they're not incentivized to do it. Hedge funds might be looking to make the most alpha, but by and large, the sell side is looking to make a market. It's looking to uh, buy, you know make money when you they buy or when they sell. That's how they make their money. The buy side, interestingly enough, is making their money by having a benchmark. So they get, need to just beat their benchmark. And well, let's talk a little bit about benchmarks, right? So everyone knows about the S and P five hundred, right? So the S and P five hundred is the you know top five hundred equities, the stocks that are traded on the U S stock market. In the fixed income world, uh, we have now, it used to be the Lehman Ag, now it's the Bloomberg Ag, right? It's a, it's a list, I don't know how many are in it, maybe 40,000 securities, maybe there are 100,000 securities, whatever it is, it's a benchmark of, a uh, diverse benchmark of securities and some board picks who, who, who the, what constituents go in there, but what rules make up the index. And so a fixed income portfolio manager is managing against this, this known a pool of securities and they're trying to beat it out and if they can't beat it out their clients are going to take their money elsewhere and if they can't beat it up and they have good service their clients are going to leave their money uh with the buy side so so again they're just trying to beat out a benchmark not trying to make uh as much money for their client as possible it's, it's restricted to uh a, a, a you know a target um they're interested in prices and cash flows pricing we, you know, we, the sell, like to get a proper mark on something, how do you know what the price of a house is? Well, you could, you, you know, obviously we all, if you have a house, if your parents have a house, or if you know someone with a house, I'm sure they think their house is worth more than it actually is. But the only way to get a price is if you get a mark. The only way to get a mark is you get a mark from someone who's going to, you know, deal in your security. And that's the sell side. The sell side have true marks. You can't collect marks for millions and millions of securities. So how do we create prices? algorithms it's it, it's 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 a huge opportunity to um figure out how to price entire asset class universes think about it just just like your equities like say you're an equity market maker and you're coming in in the morning right the stock market closes at four o'clock our, our us stock closes at four o'clock opens up at 9 30 is it nine i forgot anyway one of those times it opens up and then it closes. But before it opens up again, what should be the price of the stock coming in? Is it purely a supply and demand issue? Well, this isn't really a chicken or egg problem because the markets don't work that way. There's someone in the middle starting out the price and that's the market maker and that's the sell side uh, doing that. And so they need to know what to come in. Great opportunity to figure out what should that price be? Um, you know, just examples of using news as 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 a sentiment as an indicator uh, for the open has not been unheard of. Uh, you know, this day and age. So so it's interesting how pricing was was dark uh, until probably most recently. I would say over the past five years, they're interested in scenario analysis, running the securities in all these different ways, and then risk. Uh, uh, there's there there are these different risk models. Interestingly enough, I haven't seen. You know, uh, a proposal for an AI risk model, though I know there are a lot of, you know, uh, machine learning experts and data scientists that 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 probably have ideas. Uh, a colleague of mine, Roger Stein, who teaches at MIT and NYU, um, you know, is is a person that would have views on this. I kind of stay away from anything 
having to do with that because I don't think my clients would actually use it, but it's a really interesting topic. And I, you know, I can't imagine this not being a tenant of, you know, more advanced algorithms, data science, uh, and machine learning becoming more and more part of uh, risk management, you know, in the next five to 10 years. Um, it's, it's, it's being held back because of, you know, potential unintended consequences, explainability, all the things that you're learning in class. It's, it's really, you know, it, it, you know, the, the big problem is like, if you have a deep net and it does something, it can be so just do something so spectacularly well, if you can't explain what it's doing and prove that it's doing what it's doing on a regular basis, you can't use it in, in, in the sell side. The buy side might let you use it, but again, they most likely will shut you down. And what you find, and this might be disappointing, is what you might find both in the sell and buy side, the algorithms that they use might be limited to trees or forests or something that you know, you're splitting on. And you know, in the end, you could look at the node and you could actually see that you could turn it into a natural language and explanation for someone uh, so that they could actually say, oh yeah, I get it versus I don't know what the black box is doing. No one's going to let a black box just operate and not know what it's doing uh, in, in either the buy or sell side. And if they do, likely won't be a business or maybe they're just excessively lucky either way. Um, so so the buy side, they're, they're very focused on the portfolios and asset class coverage, lots of opportunities there uh, you know, for data science. Just, just to give you a sense of what gets me excited about this place and how much it's worth, I mean, look, some of these numbers are old. They're just, it's just been a catalog of, uh, you know, just a list of, 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 of just how much analytics are worth on the, up for, to the buy side, how much they spend on it. It's just in the billions and billions of dollars, right? I mean, you know, Reuters, Blackstone paid $17 billion for Reuters uh, for their financial assets. Uh, this is back in, uh, in 2018. Those, some of those, a subset of those financial assets, right? They bought it for $17 billion. They parlayed a subset of it into, into a $27 billion deal recently with the London Secure, uh, the London Stock Exchange. $27 billion for prices. That's a lot of money. And, and those prices, the street needs to use. So they're going to have to recoup that money. So they're going to be charging FOIA, BlackRock, and others for those prices because it's it it everyone needs a fair price uh bloomberg you know not a recent number there's probably more like 12 billion dollars i would guess but just it's not public you can probably search the internet and it's probably not accurate but i i did have a lunch sitting next to the president of bloomberg and he uh at 2016 he revealed what the numbers uh to that that people that, that group at lunch was and he said it was 9 billion in 2016 that's a lot of money so just before we go on, just to, just a little bit, you know, to get a little bit of appreciation for this, just in terms of, for those of you who I'm sure I bored and don't want a job at, in corporate America, um, in one of the banks or one of the asset managers, right? They're gonna, they're gonna limit your trading capabilities. You're gonna, you know, there's, there's still some remote jobs. A lot of you would have to come back to work. I hope you guys wouldn't mind that. But for those of you who are like thinking about startups and yeah, maybe they've gotten beaten down a little bit and maybe some people are less enthusiastic, but you know, it is, you know, I know the people who do it. Uh, it wasn't, it's never been for me, not that I haven't tried, not that I don't dabble, but the people who do it are really addicted to it. So if you're into the startup world and you're into data science and AI and machine learning and its use for uh, at least FinTech, I, you know, there's something to keep in mind, right? So are you, when you build something, are you building a product? Are you building a platform or are you selling a practice, right? So if you're coming to me and you're selling me a practice, which is, hey, I'm going to teach you how to keep your machine learning models all organized in the cloud so that you could release you're basically selling me a practice for model risk management. Yeah, there could be a tool behind it, but honestly, that has zero value. Practices that you're selling to practitioners that have been doing it for decades is worth nothing. You're, you're not going to get a sale. If you're, if you're selling a platform, like a real platform that has a piece of software, a UI, um, you know, you know who I like? Uh, something like Snorkel. For any of you guys who use Snorkel AI, I really love Snorkel. 
Um, you know, I think I was one of their first clients uh, outside of Google, uh, you know, in the financial sector, definitely. But if you take a look at a platform and the platform really isn't self-sufficient where you can hand it over to someone like, look at, you know, Microsoft's like Office 360, like, you know, yet they, 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 they produce a piece of software, they hand it to you and everyone's off, off and running on a platform. But if you need the consultancy and you find yourself dealing with your clients and you're selling consulting services, two times revenue, that's all you're worth. So if you figure, you know, you're bringing in a million bucks, you're worth 2 million bucks. You bring in 5 million bucks in, in, in your platform and your supporting consulting services, you get two times revenue. You know, look at like Palantir, Palantir platform or are people self-sufficient using Palantir? It's pretty hot. Take a look at at, 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 at at their numbers. They're probably going to look more like a product, right? And what's a product worth? A product is one where you like, you make it once and you sell it many times, like a piece of software, right? Imagine you got SaaS software and you're just like, you're in the cloud and you got this great service and everyone likes it. They like what you're doing. And you, uh, you, you just turn on another client and it's more about just sales. Uh, but to add the extra client really doesn't take a lot of calories. Um, it, that's a product four times revenue. So you take a look at a company like MSCI. MSCI was, was uh, data coming out of Morgan Stanley. That's what the MS is, Morgan Stanley. Uh, it's index data, uh, similar to the Bloomberg Ag. People who trade emerging markets portfolio are going against an MSCI index. Guaranteed, they, they, they own it. At Mike, uh, Morgan Stanley forked, turned the company public for, and got $2 billion out of, I think, a $4 billion IPO. The market cap of that IPO now is $44 billion. And they have a profit margin of 45%. I mean, just like anything they do, it's just, it just, it's all worth money. They just sell their index to the next client, the next asset manager, the next person that wants to sell a fund or an ETF based on an emerging markets index or subsector has to go through them and pays them an AUM fee. I mean, it's just an ama ama amazing business. Uh, you know, you, you take a look at what it's worth. It's it's a $44 billion business, right? We said uh, it was, it, it, it's about, it, it's worth about 20 times in, in revenue, right? The analytics business is, is, is worth a multiple of just software. It's just worth so much more and it's all distributed by software. So just a, you know, a sense of just, I, I have this note here from BlackRock and then I'll move on. Uh, you know, BlackRock's plan was to be all, was, was Aladdin, which is their service side of things where they actually help other people manage money. They have created a SaaS out of their operations where they help other people manage their portfolios they were expecting it to be about 30% of the revenue stream. It's about 10% of the revenue stream and the revenue streams, something like uh, $17 billion. And so, you know, about 2 billion of the revenue stream somewhere around there. I, I didn't, I didn't read the last, uh, 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 you know, last uh, shareholders report, but uh, it's significant. It's analytics, data science is all worth a lot of money. Buy side patterns real quickly, prospecting, we talk about things about investment management, quant strategy, a lot of opportunities on the buy side for people uh, finishing up uh, with, with degrees in data science and, of course, the servicing, right? Once they have clients, they need to service them. There's operations, clients reporting. Operations, I love operations. It's quite boring, but it's, 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 it's where there's a great opportunity to create operational efficiencies and create, you know, just really slick business processes and automation. Uh, it needs people with your brain power in order to actually make happen. If you just left it to the operations and the technology people, the operations people are the ones who receive the most change. They're the ones most likely not to do anything. They're the ones the most likely to say, oh, I love your algorithm, and turn around and tell their friends, I hate this person. They uh, don't like change. Um, and so you need to be careful with how uh, you work with them. I know we're going to run out of time, so I just want to go into the considerations because I think it's really important. It's something that I learned in uh, Bank of America uh, firsthand, and I just want to share it with you. 
you know, when you build an algorithm, you got to always ask, what's the unintended consequences of the algorithm? Did you create something that predicts a set of clients to go after next? Or did you predict uh, an investment club, right? Which is one, which is one of the pain points that a CIO would have. If you're, if you're, Salesforce is always going after the top 30 people, which you could get through descriptive analysis, then your algorithm is not doing what you want it to do. The other thing is you have to make sure that your algorithm just doesn't go haywire. We have HAL out in uh, 2000. What is it? The Space Odyssey 2000, whatever it is, there's got to be a human in the loop nowadays, right? It's getting better. But if you don't have, if, if you're not building something that has a human in the loop for the financial sector, I think you're, you're, you got to rethink what it is you're doing. You're like thinking too high. You're missing, you might be missing a point. You know, if you really have a great one, I hope you do. But if it's just automation, if it's all, all automatic and, and it doesn't have someone that has a job that needs help, that needs augmented intelligence. I think you might want to think about uh, spending your energy on, on other types of algorithms. When you try to sell these things uh, to your, your colleagues at work, you can't expect that they know as much as you. You need to develop the communication skills for selling data science and algorithms soup to nuts. You just got to keep in mind that when you're in the banking industry, most of your clients, and uh, they don't know the difference between GPT and ChatGPT. They just don't know the difference between the behavioral model and LLM. All they do is talk about AI and everything's generative and they think every single problem can be solved by generative AI. And the most important thing is these projects with data science, uh, programming, Agile development, it's just real expensive. I mean, in Agile teams, you know, you're talking about millions of bucks. Make sure you got ROI on your project. Like, what is it doing? Is it is it dealing with the regulatory issues or providing incremental sales? Are you uh, capital preservations, capital creation, uh, risk aversion, uh, time to market? Those types of things are ROI for technology and, and analytics. And you need to make sure that the project you're working on has it or don't bother coming to the table because that's the next question after your algorithm. Because most people won't understand your algorithm, but they will understand if you have something that solves a problem and its return is this, now you've 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 created interest among at least 50% of the people. Um, so I will stop there uh, to see if there have if there are any questions. Before we move on to some of the forward-looking questions, we had a question about definitions. Um, and the question is, what is the difference between quant and data scientist in finance? Are they interchangeable? <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to use a term um, uh, that, honestly, it might have been the thing that motivated me more and more to go back to school and like get to other, you know, actually know more and more about models is this notion of quantity, right? So we call them quantities. And the quantities are people that want to be traders, but they end up getting into trading through a circuitous route, or they never make it to trading because they never said, I want to be a trader. So I'll tell you, if you want to be a quant and you want to be a trader, tra a quant's a trader, right? If you build algorithms and someone else is doing the trading off the algorithms, you're quantish. You're not a quantity. If you're a programmer and you know you join the financial sector because you want to be near trading and you really love the models and you're like, I want to do this and I want to do that, but you don't really do it, you're a quantity. So you don't want to be a quantity. You want to be a trader. And I'll just give you one story of just stepping up and asking, like, if you actually get one of these jobs and you're like, you know, spending all that time building these models and you really love trading. So a, 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 a really good friend of mine, actually, he hired me at New York Life. I think he wasn't a friend of mine. He was my my boss. And um, I remember he actually brought me into BlackRock and he built models. He built, uh, he, he built prepayment models for mortgages and he always wanted to be a trader. And one day he said, I want to be a mortgage trader. And before I knew it, he was trading $50 billion worth of mortgages a day just for the asking. And he moved from development in that world, which I'm still in, and he went to trading 
and and now actually is the chief, chief risk officer of a firm that I don't know if I'm allowed to tell you about. So um, uh, there's a difference. And uh, but the data science is a practice that could be applied in, in different in, in different ways in trading and not. So like when I look at my equity quant traders, I have ver I, I have uh, you know colleagues that are very sophisticated and they're using you know deep nets, and I have others that are using more uh, trees, you know forest decision trees of that sort, you know, and then. And then many that are just really trying to analyze volumes, volumes, volumes of data, and they're doing like more data science activities, trying to find needles and haystacks, of mortgage data, et cetera. So there's a, there's a spectrum of data science activities amongst the quants. Hopefully I answered that question. That was a great answer. Um, so building on this question of you know people, you made a really good argument for the need for a human in the loop today. But we had a question about the future. So do you see AI eventually replacing some human analysts or will it always be just a tool, just a tool to assist human analysts in these businesses? I see AI sorting my oysters for me instead of this manual oyster basket that everyone else is using. Um, look, I, I could tell you that I started using Copilot. It's become, AI has become part of my day-to-day. -day. I mean, like the stuff I use, you know, chat GPT for is, you know, preparing for meetings, making sure I got all the topics of, you know, something having to do with, with uh, data governance or how to do a project or, you know, what's the ROI of doing this, that, or the other thing, you know, it can give you a, a good answer. Now it's all, it's built into teams, built into email, all those things that you want to use it. Now it's integrated. So the answer is yes, but will it be used it's used for market making, right? There's an algorithm used for market making. Um, I I, th I think it'll be used, but but the but I think like the real cool stuff that people are thinking about doing it. Just make sure you think about a human in the loop because you you you're not allowed to have unmitigated machine mm -hmm. uh, interacting directly with client in the in, in in banking. You just can't. You can't do it. And and. Everyone has that idea. They come up with it, but just remember: is there a human in the loop? The answer is no, no. But just, just, but let's get real. Honestly, let's get real. Like even, you know, the chess uh, games. You know, we know they're better than humans, or they're going to get better than humans because we catch up, and then they, the machine beats out, and you know, in the end. But in the end, it's augmented intelligence. It's given like some other person five moves, and they're picking one. So it's giving you. Hey, I'm going to prescribe, it's prescriptive. I'm going to prescribe these five things and then you pick it. That's AI, but it's augmented. So think about that. I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think the banking industry will let, let machines talk to you on the phone. I don't think you're, you know, you're going to get a chat. You're going to get chat treatment like you would, um, you know, with the current chat. I don't, I don't think someone's, I don't think from a chat, that a, a machine is actually pushing a bond to do anything in your account anytime in the next 10 years. So AI is the buzzword of the day, um, but let's think even um, more ambitiously. You, you know, you said you started your career with a passion to answer one question, which was how to read the newspaper to predict stock prices. Um, so what's the next frontier, um, especially with the advent of LLMs? If you were starting your career today, what question would you try to answer? How do you how do you weed through all the crappy news and predict stock prices? <laughs> That's what, no, but uh, you're still working on it. No, I mean I I you know you know the, one of the problems is I've like I've had I've, I've I've actually worked on that problem you know and through sentiment found that yeah sentiment's correlated with stock price movement. I've showed it over and over again in different markets and actually you know had a hedge fund. The problem with it is that the digital signal and news. This was my fear. It went away. So like the quality of the news and the signal in the news has evaporated because we've got a bunch of crap on our on, on our wires and you guys are be reading, reading a bunch of crap and, 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 and we're not paying for it. And Google's taking advantage of it. And we got the and the, got the algorithms that are taking a little bit of data and making it look like it's a whole bunch of data. So for me, it's not the, the next frontier. I, I think, you know, like more shorter term, I think what you know, like when you're 
an analyst and or you're a trader, you are responsible for explanatories. I feel like the, the big next thing is how do you use, at least on the generative side, how do you use the generative for explanatories? And if I was starting my career right now, and if I was like really gung-ho on like a product, I feel like the LLMs that are very, if you could build an LLM that's very market specific, uh, you know, vertical specific, like it had, you you have the IP for a language model that knows about loan documents or that has the language model that knows about um, IMAs or investment management agreements, right? We're spending, the, the street's spending tons of money in, 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 in all these distributed directions with the, with the consultancies and hiring programmers to like read documents, <laughs> just read them all. <laughs> I would do that. I would figure out the verticals and build build models that are very specific to the verticals because I've seen like the people with models that are very focused, the client base is focused or have success because it's very difficult to sell to the buy side and sell side. You could, you can die, you will die trying. I am the worst client you could possibly have. You don't want to sell to me because if you sell to me, I could destroy your company unintentionally because you're, you're going to do everything you can to make one of those mar marquee names happy. And you're going to like put all your best people in it as opposed to building a product. So what I would be focusing on are like models that, 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 chat GPT-4 or whatever the next one can't answer because it doesn't have the domain data. I'll give you just one thing I'll leave you with. I'm in, right now I'm sitting in St. George, Maine. And when I go to a new machine, not my machine because my machine knows me, but if I go to a new machine and I ask what the weather in St. George is, or if I ask something about St. George, I always get St. George, Utah. Like the, 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 the list that whatever it is, the brain knows St. George, Utah, and it doesn't know anything about St. George, Maine, unless I prompt it, and then maybe it gives me a little bit more about St. George, Maine, but then it gets me back to Utah, and, but if I had one that knew about Maine, I would use that instead, so, and I think it would be a, a lot more productive for me, so if I was on the business side, I'm looking for people that have, LLM, I'll be looking for people that have LLMs that are very specific to the projects that I want to take care of, which would be related to compliance, uh, specific types of documents, et cetera. I think there's a big market for that. So as someone who's also sitting in Maine, I think we just need to introduce a Maine bias into all future algorithms and, and there's the problem solved. But um, we have one minute. I'm going to ask one question because it looks like a lot of people are interested in this. And my apologies to those of you who I didn't get to your question. Um, to close us out, we had a question about learning more. Do you have any recommendations for books or materials for data scientists who want to learn more about fundamentals or basics in the financial industry? So my so whenever I get this question, and sometimes people even take me up on it, is I I I suggest two books. I love Ernie Chan's books. He's into algorithmic trading. He's got the math. He's got, he does things I think in R, but I think if you get one of his books, if you spend the time to convert his book into R or into Python, you're going to learn so much. So I like just taking Ernie Chan's books and just coding up all of his algorithms until you understand them. So I'd suggest doing that, especially if you're into algorithmic trading. Um, that would be one. And then the other book I would recommend, I don't know what he's up to, and I forgot the name of the author, but was he, is it 59 ways to improve your Python programming? Python, so I, you know, I grew up learning Pascal. No, I grew up on uh, punch cards. <laughs> I learned Pascal as an undergrad. I finished Columbia knowing Pascal. I didn't think I knew how to program. That's one, another reason why I went back to graduate school is to really learn how to code because I was surrounded by coders. So I learned C, learned object-oriented programming is C++ and Java. I learned after C++. Um, but then I had an opportunity to learn Python. Two years, I didn't, have, I didn't have to manage anyone. I went from managing like 250 people to managing no one and working on an exchange coding in Python. 
59 ways to improve your Python programming and just like really go through. It's the thinnest book you can go through, but if you can really get through every single page and learn the language, you will just, your life will be so much more harmonious because you, because this language is just so beautiful and it's got these constructs that a uh, tricks that once you learn them, you don't forget them. And um, I just think it makes your life really nice. Um, unless you, Start using ChatGPT and you start, you know, coding your algorithms by just talking to the machine. I would suggest those two books, Ernie Chan in 59 Ways, or maybe it's 100 Ways to Improve Your Python Programming. Those are my favorite two to recommend. Wonderful. Thank you. That is all we have time for. Um, for those of you, and there are many of you still with us, again, apologies for not getting to your questions. Sarah has put details of our next industry seminar in the chat. Um, it's on April 11th. But I want to say, Ron, thank you. This has been wonderful. We're incredibly grateful. Um, and we will sign out with that. Thank you to everyone. All right. Have a great win. I hope Harvard wins the NCAA tournament. Go Crimson. Go. Bye. See ya. <laughs>